to get a chance to say reminds me of when we all used to go to church together. Yes. Welcome, okay. welcome. Um, I think most of us know each other on here, either through Zoom or through church. A lot of us attend fellow churches here in whether it be um, Florida or Massachusetts or even Michigan. Uh, but at the end of the day, we're all brothers and sisters in Christ. And Revelations 4 to 6 will hopefully be something that will unite us even more. Because we know from Ellen White's book's last day events that at the end of time, Although Christians will be persecuted, there's going to be this unity in the church. Like all these like minor things that we used to disagree about will just fall to the wayside and people are going to be united just like they were in apostolic times. So hopefully this study will help us aim toward that because we know that Jesus is coming soon. And yeah. if the study is new to you for the first maybe seven, nine, ten minutes, it will just be a lecture style where I'm going to go into a lot of the background, a lot of the info. We'll watch a short little video. And then the remaining 45 minutes or so are going to be discussion. You're welcome to contribute as much or as little as you like. It's totally up to you. So to delve right into it, um, we recently finished a series on the seven churches, which are found in Revelation chapter two and Revelation chapter three. And to go back to Revelation chapter one, just in quick summary, it gives a special promise to people that study it. A lot of individuals think that Revelation is too hard to understand. Um, honestly, this comes from the time of the Reformation when the Jesuits were raised up to sow dissension in the church and they started muddying the waters. And nowadays, a lot of people think it's just too difficult to understand, so they don't even bother. But Revelation means to reveal, to show, and Jesus gives a special promise. Blessed is he that readeth, they that hear the words of the prophecy and keep the things which are written therein. Revelation chapter one, if you haven't read it yet, paints a beautiful picture of Jesus. No longer is he the meek and lowly lamb. He is the king of king and the Lord of lords. He has this beautiful white hair, these eyes like a flame of fire, this beautiful white gown. His voice is like the sound of many waters. And he basically is holding the entire world and the entire church in his hands. And remember, one of the last times that John saw him, he was nailed to the tree. So this is truly an image of Jesus that would have astounded John, just like it does today. And the Revelation chapter one also introduces us to the seven churches, because there's a ton of sevens in scripture. There's seven churches, seven trumpets, seven seals, seven bowls, and seven is a number of completeness, of perfection. So these seven churches that we recently went over are basically a summary of God's remnant church during these last 2,000 years. They're totally complete. It talks about all the good, but also all the bad, the ups and downs of church history. And that is found in Revelation chapter 2 and 3. If you want to go back tonight and just reread those, it's three chapters. It'll probably take maybe 20 minutes, if even, because they're relatively short chapters. And this is a helpful graphic I'll send out to you later that basically sums up the last 2,000 years of history. Because just like the churches were literal churches, they were also symbolic. And they summarized 2,000 years of what we as God's remnant people are going through. So what I'm going to pull up right now is a short little video. Um, the sound is not that great on my computer, so you might have to turn up the sound a little bit more on your computer. But if you've never heard the terms remnant church, or if sometimes you've read some things but have a hard time placing them in history, this is going to do a great job placing the last 2,000 years in a timeline and a short little video. So it will just be a second while I pull this up. All right, here we go. And you might have to adjust it on your computer if desired. So quick summary of the seven churches, the last 2,000 years of history. After Jesus returned to heaven, his disciples remained with the awesome task of taking the gospel to the whole world. Filled with the Holy Spirit, these men and women proclaimed the message they had received with boldness and power, reaching out to all corners of the then known world. But it was not without great opposition, first from the Jews, then from the Roman state. Many Christians were faithful to the point of death, suffering torture and humiliation from cheering onlookers at the Circus Maximus and Colosseum in Rome and throughout the empire. However, the blood of the martyrs only paved the way for the further spread of the gospel. 
After years of persecution by the Roman emperors, one of them, Constantine, professed conversion to Christianity in 312 AD. Now Christianity became popular, but it resulted in many pagan practices and symbols entering the church, particularly in Rome. The Bishop of Rome assumed more and more power and authority and began to oppose and oppress all who recognized Jesus alone as the head of the church and who accepted the Bible alone as the supreme authority. God's true people withdrew to the wilderness areas of Europe. In northern Italy, the Waldenses took refuge in the mountains. While many were slain, the light continued to shine in the darkness. God was still in control, and he began to raise up men like Wycliffe, Huss, Tyndale, Luther, Calvin and Zwingli to stand for his truth. They stood for the Bible alone, faith alone, and Christ alone. In 1798, in fulfillment of Bible prophecy in the book of Daniel, the religious and political supremacy of the Roman Church was temporarily reduced when General Berthier removed Pope Pius VI from his throne. Consequently, in the decades that followed, there arose a great awakening of interest in the prophecies of Daniel, and many were convinced Jesus was soon to return. In the United States, the Baptist preacher William Miller was joined by hundreds of other preachers in their expectation of the return of Jesus in 1844. However, when Christ did not return in 1844, further Bible study led a small group to discover that Christ's ministry in the heavenly sanctuary was an explanation for their great disappointment. They discovered that the Bible taught that the seventh day was the Sabbath that Jesus had set aside for his people. Slowly they came to understand that their mission was to preach the three angels' messages of Revelation 14. Their goal as Seventh-day Adventists was to preach with power the everlasting gospel and to prepare the world for Christ's return. More than 160 years have now passed. Years that have brought two world wars, numerous military campaigns, financial depressions, the rise of atheism and secularism, as well as a booming world population with natural disasters increasing in frequency and intensity. Today, the church's mission and message is more relevant and urgent than ever in its history. Jesus is coming soon, and the world must be warned. Prepare to meet your God. Amen. And that's the purpose of the study on the seven seals. As a history teacher, I like the history behind it. But at the end of the day, it's just for us to be ready to meet Jesus because the time is at hand. And I thought that video did a really smooth job of summing up the history of the seven churches. Um, the history of the seven churches is very similar to the history of the seven seals. So a lot of this might be review and Jesus uses a lot of repetition. I like to use repetition as well because it just implants it in our heads so that we will never forget the message of the seven churches and of the seven seals. But just like in a book, we would never skip two chapters of a book because that would confuse the rest of the plot. Same thing with Revelation. Even though the seven seals don't start being discussed until a few chapters later, we do not want to skip Revelation 4 and 5. So tonight is an intro to the seven seals because you can't really understand the seven seals without reading these two in between chapters. So the rest of the time is going to be Bible study and discussion. If you'd like to grab your Bibles, we're going to jump right into Revelation chapter 4. There is 11 verses. So if one or two people would like to read that. Even three people, it's up to you. Um, someone can start us off, and then when they stop, someone else can pick up. But we want to read the entire chapter, all 11 verses, and then we're going to jump into it and discuss it a little bit more. So anyone is welcome to start us off. Revelation chapter 4. I'll start. Thank you. After this, I looked, and behold... A door was opened in heaven, and the first voice which I heard was, as it were, of a trumpet talking with me, which said, Come up hither, and I will show thee things which must be hereafter. And immediately I was in the spirit, and behold, a throne was set in heaven, and one sat on the throne. And he that sat was to look upon like a jasper and a sardine stone, and there was a rainbow round about the throne, in sight like unto an emerald. Around the throne there were 24 thrones, and on the thrones I saw 24 elders sitting, clothed in white robes, and they had crowns of gold on their heads. 
And from the throne proceeding lightnings, thunderings, and voices, seven lamps of fire were burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. Next. <laughs> and before the throne there was the sea of glass like unto crystal. And in the midst of the throne and round about the throne were four beasts full of eyes before me and behind. And the first beast was like a lion and the second beast like a calf. The third beast had a face as a man and the fourth beast was like a flying eagle. And the four beasts had each of them six wings about him and they were full of eyes within. And they rest not day and night saying, holy, holy, holy Lord God almighty, which was and is and is to come. Can you hear me? I don't know. I'm kind of new to this. Oh, yes, we can hear you. Oh, okay. So from verse nine, whenever the living beings give glory and honor and thanks to the one sitting on the throne, the one who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders fall down and worship the one sitting on the throne, the one who lives forever and ever. And they lay their crowns before the throne and say, you are worthy, O Lord, our God, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things and they exist because you created what you pleased. Amen. Amen. So now we are going to just delve into it chunk by chunk, verses one and two. And we want to look at what do verses one and two say about the appearance of God, the appearance of heaven. But before we talk about that, we want to compare it with Daniel chapter seven, verses nine to 14. So if someone would like to read that, Daniel seven, nine to 14, and then we're going to talk about the similarities between Revelation and Daniel. Daniel 7, verse 9. I watched till thrones were put in place, and the Ancient of Days was seated. His, his garment was white as snow, and the hair of his head was like pure wool. His throne was a fiery flame, its wheels a burning fire. A fiery stream issued, <clears throat> came forth from before him. A thousand thousands ministered to him. Ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. The court was seated and the books were opened. Is that right? All the way to 14. Next. Pass. <laughs> I continued to watch because I could hear the little horn's boastful speech. I kept watching until the fourth beast was killed and its body was destroyed by fire. The other three beasts had their authority taken from them, but they were allowed to live a while longer. Hmm. It's all the way to 14. I saw in the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man came with the clouds of heaven and came to the Ancient of Days. And they brought him near before him. And there was given him dominion and glory and kingdom that all people, nations, and language should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and his kingdom, the which shall not be destroyed. Amen. Amen. So, what are some similarities? Because um, a lot of people think the sanctuary is only on this earth. But we can see the door was open in heaven. It wasn't opened into heaven. There was a door in heaven. So this is a judgment setting. This is a sanctuary setting. Um, so what are some of the similarities between what's going on, between the angels, between the beast, and between God? Hmm. A lot of information. Let me see. <laughs> and it's not a trick question. Just whatever stands out to you guys, that's what we're looking to discuss. I need a split screen here. I know. <laughs> See, I know. They were worshiping. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, that's right. Yeah, that's the first thing that comes to my mind. Mm -hmm. And also there was obedience and loyalty. Mm -hmm. Amen. Let's 
I find it amazing even the beast and the animals were worshiping. I know I've heard it before. Some people don't like Revelation. They think it's scary. Um, <laughs> with all the horror movies out there, I don't think this is scary at all. But um, right here, the beast with the eyes, like that's just like a creature we possibly haven't seen before because a lot of creatures went extinct. And whatever creature this is, whether it's literal or symbolic, even these animals are praising God. And the fact that it's covered in eyes, you know, God is all knowing, he's all seeing. So it maybe just could represent that God is omniscient, that he knows everything, that he's omnipotent, that he's everywhere. We don't know exactly if it's a literal or if it's a symbolic beast, but I liked what you guys said, you know, they're just worshiping Jesus, you know, bowing down at his feet, even the animals are. Well, Ellen White uh, relates them to the seraphim. And in Ezekiel, it 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 is a similar picture of them. And she calls them seraphim. Literally, they are. Oh, she calls the beast seraphim? Mm -hmm. These that say um, the four living beasts. Uh -huh. Yeah, she calls them seraphim. Interesting. Thank you. I, I only saw it recently, or I probably wouldn't have remembered. No, that's pretty incredible because I never thought of them as seraphim, but to me, she's authoritative. So if she says it, that's my understanding well, of it. Well, you know, you can, you can yeah. look that, but in Ezekiel, where, where he talks about the wheels turning and all that yeah. different stuff, there are similarities between them mm -hmm. and that particular thing she calls seraphim. And I think as I was looking into it a little deeper, um, that she, this was also seraphim these yeah the, they had six wings each and they covered all of, yeah she they were in the same description with the seraphim i believe wow oh. something to be studied yes <laughs> each thing four wings great beast head eagle's wings six wings is a lot of wings i tell you it is and, and then, too, he's describing the best way he can what he sees. So mm -hmm. it may not look exactly like that if you or and I were looking at it. You know how the old tale of looking at the elephant. Yeah. People saw, right. saw it different ways. <laughs> exactly. Well, they got all these beasts here, very similar. Yeah, there are similarities between the ones in Ezekiel and these. Hmm. And we can actually jump back to Ezekiel because there's another vision that is similar to this, just like Sylvia shared with us. And rainbows are actually mentioned in both visions. And it's funny, and it's not even funny, I should say it's sad. Um, in today's society, whenever God has a very powerful message to share, the devil hijacks it and creates a counterfeit. We see that with the rainbow. You know, mm -hmm. that was a symbol of God's justice and mercy. Um, for most people, that's not symbolic of that anymore. We see that with the Sabbath, you know, the devil has his ultimate counterfeit, which is True. Sunday. Um, we see that even with the um, prophecy of Ellen White, because when Ellen White was being raised up as a prophet, within a 15 to 30 mile radius, other false prophets were being raised up. Joseph Smith, mm. the Mormon church. Uh, there was a woman of the Christian science mm. church. You got the Fox sisters and the, you know, spiritualism, all that crazy knocking. Mm -hmm. And all of this was in the same part of New York. So I think Craig shared that with us that. Mm. Whenever there's a pretty powerful movement, there's a counterfeit. Mm -hmm. well, unfortunately, yeah. that's the case today with the rainbow. So we're going to go back to what does it really symbolize? So if someone could read Ezekiel 1, 26 to 28, we know from Genesis that, you know, was the promise after the flood. So we'll skip that verse for now. But if someone could read from Ezekiel, and then we'll talk about the second question. What is surrounding the throne of God? and What is its significance? Well, if I may, Ashley, also, if you back up to verse 10, it's describing those living creatures in Ezekiel. It's the same, it's the same descriptions, the ox, the eagle. Oh, the, yeah. Verse 10, J just so we don't skip right away from that, but, and then go. Yeah. You just said, even it was, though it's there. Oh, in Ezekiel it, chapter one, verse 10. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Maybe. Do you mind reading that just so that we don't skip over it? Okay. All right, 110. So um, going is from verses four down to nine, it's talking about these creatures. The four, actually in eight, under each of their four wings, I could see human hands. So each of the four beings had four faces and four wings. There's a difference right there, the wings. The wings of each living being touched the wings of the beings beside it. Each one moved straight forward in any direction without turning around. But here, 
Verse 10, each had a human face in the front, the face of a lion on the right side, the face of an ox on the left side, and the face of an eagle at the back. So the similarities are great. And um, I'm, I'm digging way into my memory here, which doesn't go very far these days. But it seems to me, she said, there was a difference between seraphim and cherubim in that one has six wings and one has four wings. Oh, but, yeah. but they're in the same class. Don't quote me on that. But yeah. as you look in her readings, you know. No, I'm glad you're sharing Definitely because that, that stimulates us. We all like to study more. So I feel like you're like giving us <laughs> good. things to good, study. Good. <laughs> eagle. What's the fourth one? Lion, lion ox, eagle. <coughs> A lion, an ox, a human face. Oh, human. Human. Lion, ox. Okay. Eagle and human. Yeah. Okay. All right. Good. And All the right. and the ones in in Revelation are human face, lion, ox, and eagle. Oh man. Yeah, pretty interesting, isn't it? That's really good. Mm -hmm. It's really good. All right. Now we're supposed to read 26? Yes, if you could. All right, let's see if I'm going to 26. 26. And above the firmament, over the heads, was likeness of a throne, and the appearance of like a, a sapphire stone. On the likeness of the throne, there was a likeness with the appearance of a man, high above it. Also, the appearance, boy, I use that word a lot, of his <laughs> weak and... Upward, I saw, as it were, the color of amber with the appearance of fire all around within it. And from the appearance of his waist and downward, I saw, <clears throat> as it were, the appearance of fire with brightness all around, like the appearance of a rainbow in a cloud on a rainy day. So was the appearance of the brightness all around <laughs> it. This was the appearance of the likeness of the glory of the Lord. More? Is that 14? Yeah, that's, or no. that was 28. Yep. That's it. Awesome. I mean, there's like one more phrase. He just falls down and worships. Oh. But yes, thank you. Thank you okay. so much. Oh, I see someone raised their hand on here. Um, You're welcome to raise your hand or you could just interject at any time. Totally up to you. But whoever 617, we would love to hear what you have to say. <laughs> Greg, is that? Is yeah, I didn't know how to take my hand down because I'm not on the screen, so I have to. Oh, I feel like I'm hijacking when I try to read something, oh. and then like I can't, I can't see that somebody else has already raised their hand. Oh. So sorry about that. Hey, <laughs> and then you, I couldn't take a, my hand down. No, it's okay. Feel we're, <laughs> we're a friendly group, so feel free to interrupt. It's totally fine because sometimes it's a little delayed on my end. So I might still keep talking. Just interrupt me. It's it's totally fine. Like that's it, it's hard sometimes to um you know measure okay. what the you know what the reception no is. No problem. Okay. How do you raise your hand? You go to I, I just hijack everything. <laughs> I don't I don't know how to raise it's my just... hand. I just butt in and interrupt and start reading. No hopefully I haven't interrupted anyone. That's all I can really do. <laughs> raise your hand, you go to reactions, and then on the bottom. It's got raised hands, and when you want to put your hand down, it it says put your hand down. <laughs> yeah, I don't have that. Oh well, <laughs> I don't either. Okay. Don't feel bad. <laughs> okay, <laughs> you know, we just interject when when we want to share. So yeah, no worries. <laughs> <laughs> so, how is this judgment seat described? Because we see there is a rainbow surrounding the throne. What does the rainbow represent? And what are some other things that stand out from the reading? Like, how would you describe this scene in heaven? Well, it sure looks beautiful in this picture here. <laughs> the rainbow is covenant-keeping God. He promised that he would never send a flood again, and he never did. You know, we have other things that people complain about, but there's no flood. So there is that. <laughs> Not yet. <laughs> <laughs> well, He's not going to send me. <laughs> not today. No, not Wednesday. <laughs> and then we're going to talk about several groups of people that are surrounding the throne of God. Um, I liked what Sylvia shared about the seraphim surrounding the throne of God. Like, you know, 
Ellen White writes about it, I definitely want to study it out more because, you know, in my head, if Ellen White says it, that clears it up for me. So <laughs> I am definitely going to um, study that more. Um, but there's also another group that's surrounding God on his throne. And this is like a little controversial. Um, I personally don't argue about these things. I like to hear a multitude of views. And I realize mm -hmm. sometimes even on the study, like people <clears throat> might have different views on that, which is great because we want to hear what you have to say. Um, I certainly am not an authoritative source. I just like to show what's taught on that particular subject. So if we go to verse four, it talks about 24 elders. And basically for 2000 years, um, Christians of all denominations have tried to identify who are these 24 elders surrounding the throne? Because it says that their thrones were cast down. And back then when you made like a judgment, you would like basically throw your cushions down and you would sit on those cushions. So you were kind of like throwing down your seat. Um, they're in a judgment setting. Some people think these 24 elders are angels. Other people think they're Jewish elders because there was 24 courses of the Levitical priesthood. So two elders from each of the 12 tribes, possibility. Um, many people believe they're beings from unfallen worlds. And then um, the last view is generally the traditional view of the church, but I know we've tweaked some things throughout the years. Um, you know, especially when it came to like the identification of the tribes of Daniel chapter two, you know, the church sometimes changes things with more light, but generally this was the traditional view and Matthew 27 talks about when, um, Jesus, well, when Jesus died, you know, and the graves were opened up and people came up, they walked throughout the cities, proclaiming the news of the gospel. Yeah. Um, Ellen White says that they were actually dressed in their traditional garb. So people were able to identify them from earlier centuries, uh, which is pretty crazy. And at the end, That's they cool. actually went to heaven with Jesus. Ephesians 4, 8 talks about they're like a first mm -hmm. fruit because during Passover, you would offer your first fruit to God. So Jesus is offering these people as a first fruit to God, looking at like, look at the fruits of my resurrection. So, so that would be an example where the Bible is silent about something that's obviously like when the disciples were watching Jesus ascend, mm -hmm. they were essentially watching the others ascend with him. Mm -hmm. But the Bible was like visually silent on that, mm -hmm. even though we know that that must've been what was happening. Right. right. That's cool. Yeah. So my question for you guys is, what are your thoughts on this? Have you studied this out? Do you have a particular bend a certain way? Cause we want to, and I, Sylvia, I see your hand as well. Well, you're welcome to share or, you know, okay. interrupt anytime. <laughs> well, there's um, in chapter four, when we go to the throne room, um, Jesus isn't there. God is there. Jesus isn't there. Mm -hmm. And he's not there until, and I forget which chapter it is, but several chapters later. And if you want to listen to this thing on the 24 elders with Stephen Bohr, mm -hmm. I don't know if you're familiar with him. I was amazed. Mm -hmm. And that was the idea that there are these 24 elders are representatives from different unfallen worlds. And one reason is that if this is the throne room before Jesus actually got there, <laughs> remember he said at Mary, don't touch me because I haven't ascended yet. And this is like, as we go into it, this is like they're getting prepared for Jesus to come up in the throne room. And the 24 elders are already there. Now, if that's so, it can't be the people he took with him because he hasn't gone up yet. The The other side of that, um, in a nutshell, is that as we read Ellen White, we find that she called Adam a representative. We also uh, he would have been a representative of the world if he had not fallen. Mm -hmm. And Satan, because Satan took the authority from Adam, because it was given to him by him, Satan then became, remember how Satan went into the courts of God for quite some time? He was the representative of earth. So you put those things together and his spiel on this is really interesting. You, you should go listen to it. I'm glad you brought it up because I actually have an email that I'm sending out after this and I attached his sermons on the <laughs> skills. And, and if you guys like to read the print version, because sometimes I like to read rather than listen, um, mm -hmm. just type in like Stephen Bohr Revelation commentary. Um, it, it's it's phenomenal. You know, mm -hmm. he, he really does wow. research. 
Um, so I encourage you guys to check that out because I'll send you the um his sermons on the seven seals, but he also writes very extensively on that. And yeah, I was just looking at that the other night. So I'm so happy you brought that up because um Stephen Bohr, I believe he was at the Cape Coral Church. Um, Shakira, were you there when he was at your church? I think it was like a, I don't know if it was like a year and a half ago or something. Sorry, I think there's a lag with my video. Oh, okay. But yeah, I was there. Um, we held it at a, uh, like another location on Nicholas Parkway in Cape Coral because we were expecting a, a, like a larger amount of people than the church could accommodate. But yeah, I was, um, I was there. I think it was it was for the weekend. So there was Friday, Sabbath, and then I think Saturday night, or I think it started Thursday. I can't remember, but it was like a two, three day um series. He didn't I don't think he touched on the 24 elders, but I have heard of the the um the sermon that you guys are referencing as well. And I want to watch that at some point. <laughs> that's pretty that's like a celebrity coming to Southwest Florida. That's pretty awesome. <laughs> <laughs> And as we continue going throughout the chapter here, um, we can see that there's an additional group surrounding God. So not only are there the 24 elders, um, but there's an additional group here. And we read a little bit in Ezekiel 1 about um, some of these creatures. So some of this I'm just going to sum up for the sake of time. I will actually send this to you guys afterwards. That way, the parts that we skipped, you can look them up if you want. Um, but the purpose of these creatures is not to terrify people. It's to praise God. Everything <laughs> they have yeah. praises God. And I found this really interesting. I don't know where I came across it. I just wrote the notes in my Bible. But um, these four different animals that are portrayed in Revelation chapter four could possibly describe Jesus as portrayed in the Gospels. Because mm -hmm. as you know, there's four different Gospels written to four different groups of people, written by four different drastically or four drastically different men. And they had a different purpose in mind. Like Matthew <laughs> preaches to the Jews. So he quotes a lot of Old Testament prophecy. You know, Luke is writing to the Gentiles, so he references a lot of history and gives the context. So Mark was written by John Mark for Peter, because Peter, for the most part, was illiterate, being a fisherman. And Mark sounds just like Peter. It's really short, mm. it's quick, it's to the point. All the chapters are super short, as little details as possible. So because the four Gospels portray four different aspects of Jesus, maybe these four different creatures are describing four different sides of him because a lion represents strength. And Matthew talks a lot about his kingly side. That's why he's showing the Jews that Jesus is the king that was prophesied. You know, an mm. ox is a menial animal, a service animal. And in Mark, Jesus is portrayed as a servant. Um, in Luke, Jesus is not only portrayed as being fully God, but also as being fully human. And then lastly, an eagle we know is very powerful. And out of all the Gospels, John is the most philosophical. It's also the deepest. And it very possibly could represent Jesus as the deity who created all things. So I don't know um, how accurate this is, but to me, it was very interesting. I definitely wanted to share it with you because I came across it, I think, on a website and in a book. So apparently it is an interpretation of Revelation 4 that is going around. And I thought it was very beautiful. Um, Ellen White talks a little bit about um, the fact that there are other planets and there are other beings. Um, they're not aliens because obviously holy oh, beings do not enter our atmosphere to talk to us. Um, at one point, they all had a tree of knowledge of good and evil on their planet. And we are the only planet that partook of it. So eventually that tree was removed from all their planets. But this is just very interesting. It may be new to some of you. For a lot of you, it may be familiar. But it just reminds us that there's beings and other planets that continue to praise God. So if someone would like to read these three really short paragraphs, um, I think it's just beautiful and it's exciting what we're eventually going to see. The I can Lord, read the first one. Oh, go ahead. The Lord has given me a view of other worlds. Readings were given me in an angel attended me from the city to a place that was bright and glorious. The grass of the place was living green, and the birds, they, they were, 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 were a sweet song. The inhabitants of the place were, all si were of all sizes. They were noble, majestic, and lovely. They bore the express image of Jesus, and their countenance beamed with holy joy, expressive 
of the freedom and happiness of the place. Pass. I asked one of them why they were so much more lovely than those on the earth. The reply was, we have lived in strict obedience to the commandments of God and have not fallen by disobedience like those on earth. I begged of my attending angel to let me remain in that place. I could not bear the thought of coming back to this dark world again. And I include that slide because sometimes, especially if you're a new believer, there's some confusion between like beings from other planets, between aliens. And we know that aliens because they're appearing to people on the sinful earth cannot possibly be holy individuals because angels wouldn't have no need to disguise themselves as this like hybrid, you know, being. And Ellen White sure. actually talks a little bit about, um, you know, last week's reception. <coughs> and Shakira just sent me a um, video clip, which I'll send it out to you guys earlier, or I'll send it out to you afterwards. Um, I can never say his name, guys. Is it M Monero? How do you say the guy that- um, Roger Mur 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 Murno. Murno, okay, Murno, thank you. French was never my specialty, <laughs> thank you very much. And <laughs> basically he was interviewed like 30 years ago and when he worked for the occult and actually you know, was involved in the new age movement, they were predicting that one of the last day deceptions was gonna be aliens appearing to people. But these are demons that are appearing to people. And he said they're mm -hmm. eventually going to tell people that they need to start keeping Sunday for the good of the world. And then people that don't start keeping Sunday are going to be persecuted. And it's very sure. interesting because this was like way before there was any talk of like global warming and environmental issues and resting on Sunday. You know, this was in the early 80s that he was sharing what he had learned wow. in the 40s and 50s. So it's really short. It's only like seven minutes. So I will definitely share that with you in the email that will come out after this, because to me, that was just incredible that everything he had shared is coming to pass right now. It's even on the news. But the good thing is we don't have to be scared. If we go to Revelation chapter five, it's fairly short and um, it's definitely worth reading. It's basically a psalm of praise here. The first part's a little sad but then it gets really happy. So if we could jump right into Revelation chapter five, there's 14 verses. So feel free to read what you would like. And then when you stop, someone else can jump in as well. Okay. Um, and and I to... <laughs> no, go ahead. Okay. I, Go ahead, Marcus. I just ex I just accidentally ended up finding myself on three, so I'm way behind. All right. And I saw in the right hand of him who sat on the throne a scroll written inside on the on the back, sealed with seven seals. Then I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, "Who is worthy to open the scroll and to loose the seals?" And no one in heaven or on the earth or under under the earth was able to open the scroll or to look at it fast. And I wept much because no man was found worthy to open and read the book, neither to look thereon. And one of the elders said, saith unto me, weep not, behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, hath prevailed to open the book and to loose the seven seals thereof. And I beheld, and lo, in the midst of the throne and of the four beasts, and in the midst of the elders, stood a lamb as it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God, sent forth into all the earth. And he came and took the book out of the right hand of him that sat upon the throne. And when he had taken the book, the four beasts and the four and twenty elders fell down before the lamb, having every one of them harps and golden vials full of odors, which are the prayers of saints. And they sung a new song saying, thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof, for thou waste claim slain and hast redeemed us to God by thy blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation and has made us unto our God kings and priests, and we shall reign on earth. Amen. See, that that's where um, in chapter 5, 
four doesn't have Jesus, but in five, they're wondering who's going to open the seal, open this, yeah, to open that. And in in five, the the elder who is already there says, stop weeping and look, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the heir of David's throne has won the victory. So now Jesus has come up. So if the elder is one that he brought with him, he wouldn't have already been there to be there when Jesus gets there. Did that make sense? <laughs> no, that does. Like, I, I definitely want to check out that board because whatever there's like, you know, different views, I want to study out each one. And like, I see what you're saying, like the rationale, that makes perfect sense. Hmm. Well, Stephen Bohr presents it very nicely. Mm -hmm. well, and yeah. then when you go in and check out the different writings of Alan White and and find the, the different play. It's just, it's fascinating when you go in there. <laughs> Are we reading all the way to 14? Yes, because that's the best part, I think. All <laughs> right, I'll start at 11. Then I looked and heard the voice of many angels around the throne and the living angels and the elders and the number of them was 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousands saying with a loud voice, worthy is the lamb who was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. And every creature which is in heaven and on the earth and under the earth and such as are in the sea and all that are in them heard saying, blessing and honor and glory and power be to him who sits on the throne and to the lamb forever and ever. Then the four living creatures said, amen. And the 24 <laughs> elders fell down and worshiped him who lives forever and ever. Amen. Amen. So we'll just briefly discuss these three questions on here. Um, for the sake of time, we just try to keep it like pretty fast paced. So I'm sorry, I don't, I tend to in my presentations go more broader rather than deep, just because Revelation is such a big book. Um, but feel free to share. Um, but if, if you um, wanted like a more unpacking of each verse, I'm sorry that I kept it, you know, pretty short and pretty basic here, but that was only for the sake of time so that next week we could jump into the first seal. And next week we're actually going to spend the entire time on two verses. So we will have a lot of time to go into <laughs> a lot of depth. But I, I like what everyone's sharing here. You know, Sylvia, I want to study that out more. I'm going to send you guys out the links afterwards um, from what she's recommending from Stephen Bohr. Um, also, I know Elaine shares a lot from John Pauline. I want to send him out as well. You're the um, cancel. And what were you saying? I was telling my computer to stop talking. <laughs> uh, Alexa, I should say. So for this Sorry. here, we could go as deep or as broad as you would like to go. Um, but for these three questions, the first is, why can no man open the scroll? Uh, maybe because... seals. <laughs> I was going to say something. Oh, yes. The effect of, um... Unworthy. Unworthy. Mm -hmm. Nobody was found worthy. Amen. Oh, Deidre, were you saying something? Oh, that's pretty much, that sums it up pretty much. I was going to say something to that effect, that Jesus was the only one, the lamb that had been slain was the only one that was worthy to do so. Hmm. Yeah. That's <laughs> pretty good. much, Yeah. <laughs> I encourage you to check out these two verses later on from Isaiah. Um, you know, Isaiah is just this incredible book that points to the Messiah. And there are some accompanying verses that describe why Jesus was the only one that can open the scroll. And then at this point, all of creation is praising Jesus. So what are some of the reasons, particularly in this context, that they're praising Jesus? What verses? He's holy. He's yeah. holy. He's holy. Holy, holy, holy. I write. He's Yo. won the victory. Well, true. And, and in verse 10, it says, and he made us kings and priests to our God, and we shall <laughs> reign on the earth. Did you know you were yep. a king and a priest? <laughs> Amen. I don't want to be. I just want to sit by the brook. <laughs> <laughs> it says he's redeemed us by his blood. He's redeemed ah. us to God by his blood. <laughs> There's a whole song about that. <laughs> Yeah, a few songs also, about that. 
I'll send this out to you afterwards because I know a lot of you guys are fellow music lovers and Handel's Messiah okay. oftentimes focused just on the Hallelujah Chorus. And I've probably heard it so many times in my life that honestly, sometimes I get kind of sick of it. But there are so many other aspects of Handel's Messiah. And there's a certain snippet from Revelation 5, verses 12 to 14. The link here is probably the most beautiful link. I've literally listened to it probably at least 75 times. It's gorgeous. It's only three minutes long. Um, it's by one of those young boys choirs where they have these amazing voices. So I'll send this to you afterwards if you want to listen to it, because it's Handel takes Revelation chapter five, particularly these verses, and puts it to music. And you can just imagine all of creation praising God. What Amen. song is it? It is. Um, I don't know what the title is, actually. I have a pulled uh, up one here for the sake of time. Funny. For the sake of time, I won't play it right now. But I do want to yeah. at least show you what it looks like. So just a second. Um, because it, it's like in Latin, I'm assuming. Oh, worthy is the lamb. So that's why I didn't recognize it. Here, the I don't know what the other. I don't know what the other um, Latin inscription is, but it's called worthy is the lamb. And there's we a lot have of a hymn by that title. Oh, really? Right. Worthy, yes, worthy is the lamb. Oh, that's, yeah, that's right. That's a beautiful song. Amen. Amen. So now, now we know a little of the historical background behind that. And for those of you that like history, we are going to delve into that a lot more next week because next week is only two verses on the first seal. And you can see this chart here, this visual of what's coming up. Um, there's a lot of different horses. There's some souls, some heavenly signs, silence in heaven. And this gives you an approximate date of when those events are happening. And it's very similar to the seven churches. So a lot of this will be coming back from what we learned in previous weeks. And some people get the seven seals and the seven trumpets confused, understandably so, especially if Revelation is new to you. Um, but just remember that trumpet is a sign of war. So the trumpets are more like judgments. There's not much good happening in the trumpets because God is punishing his people for apostatizing, rightfully so. But the seals are more of a religious character. So just like the seven churches are talking about the religious history, the seven seals are also talking about the religious history. And then when we eventually get to the judgments, it's talking more about great political commotions, punishment that is going on. Because sometimes people use these two synonymously, and they're actually two different aspects of history. The seals are more about church history, and the trumpets are more about the punishment, about the chastisement that the church greatly needed. If you're a visual person, these are a lot of different graphics I will send out to you later tonight, just in case you're like, I like to make my own charts, but I don't know how to do it on the computer. So I just pulled someone else's chart that I thought looked pretty good. Ashley, and, do you have the reference of that chart? I looked uh, online today to find that, but I couldn't. And I was wondering if you all thought that, let's go down under the first seal, uh, okay. then there's the first trumpet. And the first plagues, is that all relative to, to the order that these come into? You mean, are they happening at the same time or, or what do you yeah. mean? Yes. Um, I don't know. It's, it's probably difficult to understand, but looking at the first seal and then underneath it is the first trumpet. Mm -hmm. And then underneath that is the first plague. Mm -hmm. Are these all happening after each other? Or are these separate events? Well, the first seal happened from about 31 to 100 AD. So this was when the gospel is going out and getting preached. The first trumpet, there are some debating within the church. There's four different views on the trumpets. Uh, the traditional view was that those were the Visigoths. So in about 400 AD, um, they were laying siege to the Catholic Church and destroying them. And some people think this was allowed because the Catholic Church was corrupting doctrine. So I would say those two are separated by maybe 300, 400 <clears throat> years. And then some people say the plagues are already starting to happen. Um, but many Adventists, myself included, believe that the plagues are in the future. Um, but that we're definitely open up to discussing that because people may have different views. So my understanding is, although it's a handy chart, I don't think they're happening at the same time. Um, most of the seals have already happened. Um, most of the trumpets have already happened. And as far as I know, but we'll get into it a lot more, um, the plagues or the trumpets may be in the near future. I don't know if that helps, but... I'll definitely gather gather more information. 
Yeah, having a reference to that chart would be be helpful because I want to study it more. Thank you. Yeah, I, will definitely I, I have a I have a slightly hybrid view today that mm -hmm. I, I believe there's the historical fulfillment that we've taught and believed as Adventists, and that that's true, mm -hmm. but that was only a partial fulfillment and. I believe there's another antitypical fulfillment in our time where things happen a little bit differently. And that's actually the final complete fulfillment of the seals and the trumpets and the plagues. So I can share with you a, a sermon I preached at Benita that kind of summarizes that idea. No, I would, yes, I would love that. Like, please send it out because I believe in dual prophecies as well. And I, I never thought of those as being, um, duly prophetic amen hmm. jose brought that out in his revelation class it was very interesting that the trumpets are yet to be maybe for the second time like you were just saying dual and the last part here is and once again i apologize that we're going broader rather than deeper but i don't want to keep you here all night so that's why i'm like keeping it quick um, Revelation reminds us that there's a special blessing to those of us that take the time to study Revelation because it's not natural to us. Like naturally, what do people want to do after work? Like watch TV or go to the gym or hang out or, you know, do anything besides meet together and study Revelation. The fact that we're <laughs> interested is actually like amazing. It means that God is helping us become spiritually minded. Amen. And if you've ever found yourself in a rut or maybe not interested in spiritual matters like you would like to be. Revelation is good for revitalizing that. These are some of my favorite quotes from Ellen White, which give me motivation to study prophecy. So I was hoping that one or two people could read what Ellen White has to say, and then we're going to talk about the question at the bottom. Hmm. Uh, Revelation 1 to 3, Blessed is he that readeth, and they that hear the words of this prophecy, and keep those things which are written therein, for the time is at ham, hand, pass. <laughs> <laughs> there is need of much closer study of the word of God, especially should Daniel and Revelation have attention as never before. The light that Daniel received from God was given especially for these last days. Kenneth Cox has written two interesting books. One is called Revelation Pure and Simple, and the other book is... Uh, Daniel Revelation, uh, Daniel Pure and Simple. Uh, I find these two companion books a great read. Hmm. So right. the Revelation, also uh, uh, the Sanctuary Pure and Simple. Okay, right. yeah. It's also another one by Kenneth Cox. I wish there were other ones too. I'd like to have an Ezekiel made simple, one for every book of the Bible would be great. <laughs> Well, the other thing, too, that's rather interesting is that um, John Pauline has written a commentary on the book of Revelation. Uh, it hasn't been finished because he's still working on chapter 21. And I have emailed this to Ashley uh, a while back, and he offers some very interesting insights at all of this. I'll send it out again. I, I think I sent out like some emails maybe a few weeks ago with some follow-up resources that different people shared. And I could definitely find it again and I'll resend it out. And Ellen White just reminds us that when we study these books, we are going to have a totally different religious experience. So my religious experience could be pretty basic at times. But then as soon as I start getting into prophecy, it's like everything mm -hmm. makes so much more sense. Like I know <laughs> Jesus is coming soon. So whatever sin I'm struggling with, like I don't want to struggle with it because Jesus is coming soon. But if mm -hmm. I get away from prophecy, I start thinking like, oh, I have a long time until Jesus comes, you know, and all of a sudden it's not as urgent to deal with what I need to deal with. Mm -hmm. So the question for you guys is what are some of the benefits you've received through studying Revelation? Because pretty much as far as I know, all of you guys studied a lot on your own. Um, what are some physical, emotional, relational benefits you've received through Revelation? I've studied Revelation for quite a while. And what I find is that even after today, I find even more answers as I go along. So more of it perhaps is revealing or more of it has to do with my understanding based on previous information that I had. Today, I learned more about the 144,000. It's just a, 
a wide number, which represents that there'd be a lot of people from different uh, religions and different faiths uh, that will be there, you know? So I find it very interesting to continue on. When I read Revelation, it makes me realize that there are so many people that I would like to share this with. I want to reach those people that that would get that information. Well, just everybody needs to have it so they can make the right choice. Amen. I say it helps me to feel like comforted, I guess, because initially growing up in the Adventist church, it's like I would hear the revelation seminars and I'd be so scared about, you know, the beast and like all these things. And then as I study it, I recognize that, you know, the, it's given to us to understand because that's what the first, you know, few words are that, or that we should read and that there's a, you know, blessing in reading it, I should say. So for me, it, it, it I no longer feel like worried and nervous and like scared um, when reading it and like really studying and understanding what I'm reading. Mm -hmm. oh. <laughs> for me it helps cement the rest of the bible too because as i read the book of revelation much of it of course is companionable to daniel but other places too throughout the bible and to have them all fit in so well and help explain each other just gives me more confidence in the word it also gets me excited because kind of like you were saying, Ashley, whatever is in my life, it may not come in my lifetime, but I know it's going to get better. Amen. And then there are the, the many, many different interpretations. And that part confuses, but challenges me. Right. And therefore I get into my Bible. Good. And that's, as we're coming up, um, we're going to get deeper into it. Today was just like a basic overview um, because I don't like skipping chapters. So, you know, we studied the seven churches and instead of skipping two chapters and getting confused, it's better to read those two chapters and then get right into the seven seals. And this group is very mm -hmm. open to um, different views because some of these, especially when it comes to the trumpets, there's like four views in the church. Um, there's differences between people. We love to hear it. We like this type of content. So do not hesitate to share because even if I hold a different view, I'm not authoritative. I would like to learn as well. Um, so anything that you guys come across, I'm going to try to find some of the resources that you shared and put them in an email. Um, but if you guys have those resources readily available, just email it to me and I'll send it out to the group. That way you guys, you don't have homework. You're adults. I, one of the best things about being adults is no homework. It's all <laughs> optional. But um, but it's up to you how much you would like to study this next week. Well, I, I believe it's providential, Sister Ashley, because I don't think you can properly understand the seals until you first go through Revelation 4 and 5. They, they really go together. Oh, and Mark, I think I could see your screen just in case there's anything confidential on there. Like, I think because we're both on the church account, um, your screen is showing up. Really? Just so that, yeah, just so that like finances or anything, we don't want anything confidential <laughs> popping up. <laughs> just trying to get back to where I was. I was fooling around. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how to get back there. <laughs> oh, man. Well, it is um, seven o'clock on the dot, actually 701. So um, if someone wouldn't mind closing us in prayer, and then you'll get a lengthy email later tonight. And you could do whatever you'd like with that email, but we hope you guys come back next week. So if someone wants to close us, that would be great. Certainly. Well, if you're waiting for me, I'd like to pray. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Dear Father in heaven, I'm just so appreciative of my brothers and sisters sharing their love for you. And I, we lift up our hands to you, Lord, that you are great and wonderful. You've always taken care of us and you'll take care of us now. You made us sons and daughters of God. You made us priests and kings. We are just lovely because you have made us lovely. We are righteous because you've made us righteous. So thank you Lord, for this time. Inspire us, Lord, to continue to study and read. We thank you, Lord, for Ashley. We thank you, Lord, for this time. And I thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thanks, God. Bye. 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 Thank you, Ashley. Thank you, Ashley. It was so good to hear Bye. you.
Oh, <laughs> oh, I get out of it. Oh, Have a good night, everyone. <laughs>